or welcome to the uh, Mad and Crypt Theology podcast. We're so happy that you're here this afternoon um, to join us. And Miriam, my faithful co-host, is away today. So my friend Wendy Cranston has so graciously agreed to come on and be here with us today. So hi, Wendy. Hi. Hello. So um, we are so excited to have Amira and Eliana joining us today. So I'm going to ask you both to introduce yourselves, if you don't mind. So, um, so the introductions that we're wondering if you could give us are to give your name, your pronouns, your work and academic locations currently, um, your connection to mental health and disability, your connection to the journal, um, and also to give a visual description of yourself. So what you look like, what you're wearing um, for the folks who are listening to the podcast. Uh, do I start? <laughs> uh, Amira, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, my name is Amira. I'm, uh, I'm born in Egypt, Alexandria, Mediterranean, and I'm originally a pharmacist who turned into natural health looking for answers that Big Pharma doesn't offer. I had my PhD in natural health, and then I decided to study the missing link, spirituality and theology, and, and, and um, did my uh, master of pastoral study at Emmanuel College. And currently I work at Scarborough uh, Health Network. I'm a spiritual care practitioner. Um, my uh, connection to the journal, um, Maybe I started, uh, I, I consider myself storyteller and mixed media artist. I'm obsessed with art journaling and art building. And I, for, a year, for some years now, I held a women retreat uh, called Healing with Art and Stories. And I guess from this retreat was born the idea of the paper that I published in the journal. So it's a journey of uh, women and use of art and connection with the body to uh, to achieve the transformation. Uh, my visual description, I am uh, Middle Eastern, so I'm, I'm not white and I'm not exactly brown, so I don't know what color exactly I'm. Uh, uh, I have uh, greenish blue eyes, I wear glasses, I wear the headscarf, hijab, and um, I'm wearing a blue uh, shirt and bright yellow uh, cardigan. I my has cards the same colors, and uh, I love colors and, and matching colors. And this it's basically this is uh, what I'm wearing. Yeah. Mira, thank you very much. You. Eliana, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, actually, um, it is hardest. <laughs> Why? What should I do? My name is Eliana Adam Gu. I'm in Korea. I'm, I'm Korean, definitely. <laughs> and um, uh, I am awarded PhD in homiletics at Emmanuel College <laughs> uh, last summer. And my convocation was definitely mid-May, <laughs> this May. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't attend because I'm physically in Korea. Um, and I am a mother of two children. Uh, uh, my daughter is a um, teenager and my son is yeah also a teenager, but he's in grade school. Anyway, <laughs> and um, uh, my, uh, yeah, my academic location and uh, I did. And uh, yeah, and my connection to mental health and disability journal. I recently published uh, uh, an article about um, postnatal depression and put washing in lament language. <laughs> so yeah, I am very excited to um, converse with um, in podcast and um, Oh, my visual description. Yeah, I also love colors, but <laughs> I'm wearing black shirt <laughs> because <laughs> because 2 a.m. right now. <laughs> and, 
Um, and I'm wearing um, glasses um, to screen, um, what is it, the, the blue radiation from computer. <laughs> so it looks like, you know, dragonfly. <laughs> is it? Yeah. And yeah, quite, um, uh, quite quiet around me because everyone is sleeping. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eliana, for staying up this late to talk to us. We really appreciate it. And if, if we see you nodding off, we'll, we'll do a little dance or something to wake you up. <laughs> um, and we want to say how much we just uh, appreciate your contributions to the spring issue of the journal. And um, so the first question that we want to ask you both relates to uh, when Miriam and I usually think up the questions, we try to think of um, similarities between people's pieces. And we were thinking how, how similar, there were similar themes in both of your papers that you wrote. This idea of um, the context of women and also uh, issues around depression. So we, we wanted to ask you, so this question is for you both. So you both uplift the significance of women's experiences of depression. And we wanted to ask you, can you tell us if depression is normalized in your faith communities or how this might become so? So Amira, I'm gonna invite you to respond first. Um, okay, so, well, I, I don't think it's fully normalized. It's still a stigma. Uh, it's, I, I, there are, a lot of advancement, advancement on how it is now. People can talk more about it, but still, it, it's still seen as lack of faith, lack of gratitude. Even the the woman that uh, herself feel guilty and ashamed and feels that she's not good enough if she has some form of depression. And what's interest, interesting thing also, I, I recently noticed that medication has become to some extent normalized. So it's they they talk about oh I'm taking medications they don't call them antidepressants they just mm -hmm. uh, medication and uh, maybe the brand name but not the, the word depression itself is not uh, fully acknowledged and um, but the use of medication although it is good I'm, uh, of course I'm I'm not against medication in any way but it, it's good that it's um, it's normalized but in the same time it, I, I've seen it that it is used as some form to avoid dealing with the depression itself, to avoid engaging life and sometimes even re enhance in uh, enforcing the, the victimhood mentality of the woman. So it becomes easier to pop a pill than to dig deeper or deal with emotion or make some change in life. So yeah, unfortunately, so it's still a lot of work to be done in the community. Well, thanks. That's really helpful. And um, so what are some of the things that you think, Amira, should be done to help normalize depression? You were talking about like uh, calling calling the pills what they are. That mm -hmm. might help, you know? Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and, and what else? What else comes to mind? Well, I, I guess we're always maybe as or psychotherapist or even doctors, it, it have been with sometime talking as the expert in the field, but now I see that we are now within the people talking about our own experience, our own struggle, our own life challenges. So having this some form of self-disclosure, making this safe space so everyone can talk about it's a normal thing and it's not... But again, not falling into the victimhood mentality again. It's just this fine line between normalizing it, but in the same and, and talking about it, talking about your experience in the same time, open a safe space for the woman, for the woman to to talk and to share their own experience. Thanks so much, Amira. Yes, and I'm sure some of a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, at the hospital provides that safe space for women to talk about this. So, so thank you so much for that work that you're doing. 
And uh, Eliana, what about you? Um, is, is depression normalized in your faith community in Korea? Um, uh, the communities I have experienced are Korean Canadian immigrant churches and, and Korean mm -hmm. churches. Mm -hmm. um, these churches, these faith communities are similar yet different. Um, because um, sometimes Korean uh, ministers agree that um, the culture of the immigrant church has the value of, you know, the time that, you know, the dominant, um, dominant generation, uh, when the dominant generation left Korea. Uh, in other words, um, I'd like to say um, that um, um, the values of Korean church uh, can be a little more um, flexible and open to change. So, um, that means uh, like it, you know, the normalizing depression depends on um, cultural characteristics, but in the same culture, like Korean culture, there's some kind of, you know, variation, variations and differences. Um, so in, um, you know, in Korea, it is a, a culture that makes it you know, virtue, a virtue to be patient rather than um, talk to another, like ask for help when um, people meet um, difficulties. Although this culture uh, may vary according to the uh, inclination of social relationship group or individuals, but still Korean children learn that it is good to have some tolerance or pain. Mm. Mm -hmm. physically and mentally so um yeah from i um also in korea it seems that um the mentality of mothers like especially mothers is not managed at the national level when i was in uh, when i was living in vancouver i was surprised that um to learn that a friend of mine who were uh, who, who who was pregnant was getting kind of regular check on her mental health from uh, some, you know, a center. I don't know exactly what center was, but yeah, he, she has some kind of support. But um, from my experience, there is no support at the national level. So yeah, in that kind of background, in the faith community, little awareness and little like, recognition about depression. And Eliana, you were talking about there about how there's a there's like um a prioritization or like there's a um an uplifting of tolerance of pain in the culture. Do you think would you equate that tolerance of pain to like um uh, normalization of suffering or is it more like uh un like um sorry my brain's not working like um thinking that suffering is a part of a woman's journey and it's something that people might praise them for this suffering mm. or or not you know, uh, maybe bearing their cross or taking up their cross. Is there any of that? Uh, it's um, um, quite complicating. <laughs> of course. <laughs> because, you know, many situations and oppressions are mixed and multi-layered. Mm -hmm. So um mm, in culture it, especially korean culture we have three main religious traditions confucian confucian, confucian culture and Buddh buddhism culture and christian culture and um based on um uh, yeah uh, based on shamanism so <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> quite mixed up in in that culture um, to understand the suffering, especially for women, it's not um, quite normalized to open up to the public. For men, it is um, more hard, you know, 
it is harder to express their suffering. But yeah, for women, um, it's hard to because it's not a social virtue. The tolerance mm. is a social virtue to yeah, deal with, deal with their suffering. I see, okay. And so uh, what would you say, I mean, obviously your, your paper that you submitted for the journal that talks about um, postnatal depression and is a uh, one way that we can um, help to normalize uh, depression in the community because we're talking about it, like Amira said, we're opening up the space and we're saying this is something that a lot of people experience. Um, so writing about this, talking about it, getting it online is so important. Is there anything else that comes to mind about how depression could be more normalized in the, in the community for you? Yeah, for me, like using, <laughs> using lament language in solidarity. Mm -hmm. Like I, uh, when I uh, suffered from depression, it, it was quite severe. Um, I wanted to feel like some kind of uh, sense of connectness. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was, I think I was isolated, very isolated from family, um, face community and other, you know, friendship. Um, uh, recently, one of the church members has complained of severe depression, her depression to me. It was such a difficult situation. Um, she had, you know, <laughs> um, uh, some kind of thought about uh, a suicide or thought several times. So, so it was quite simple. Yeah, she didn't want to any counseling help. I, I, you know, the cultural situation, and she wanted. She didn't want to, you know, open up her situation to others, especially in uh, faith community. And she wanted to get through it uh, herself. So while mm -hmm. she felt, um, as she spoke with. Uh, as I spoke with her was, um, in our community, depression is not recognized as a loss of health. Depression mm -hmm. is very subjective and it's, it's, um, its severeness cannot be measured. So that is why when someone shares uh, with their community that they are depressed, it is treated more lightly than, um, you know, the being physically hurt. So um, when I um, talked with her, what I realized was uh, she and I um, know, I mean, our community know our depression is making our lives and our souls so much um, um, being hurt and ruin our, you know, identity and personality, you know, everything. And we found like we carve constant attention, a sense of connection, as I mentioned before. So uh, in that sense, uh, the lament language is really, really necessary to deal with suffering and you know, mental or physical and physical suffering as well. Um, uh, let me um, take an example. The reason I started lament as my academic uh, journey was because I was I, I experienced a sexual abuse. I, I was a sec, I am a sexual abuse survivor. I had been through um, a very long time of pain, and it has led me to lament. Um, the reason I uh, talk about um, my, you know, trauma, uh, revealing my vulnerability makes um, quite big differences to share and to participate in others' pain. So um, the mutual, uh, mutual lament can be practiced when we open up our um, pain, trauma, and vulnerability, um, honestly. Thank you, Eliana, for sharing that. And I, I totally agree that sharing our pain and 
you know, bearing along with others on our journeys is so important. So we're just so glad that you're here today sharing with us. So thank you. I think Wendy's gonna ask our next question. Um, Eliana, the next question is, um, is for you. And I think that it's a carry on of the conversation that we've been having. Um, you said in your author's note that when you experience postnatal depression after having your two children, you receive no help from your faith community. Thinking back to that time, what would you have wanted them to do for you? What would you have wanted them not to do for you? Yeah, especially language was important to me. Like, as I mentioned before, like someone uh, likely say, it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's very normal. And uh, you need to like endure or God will heal you. <laughs> Something like that. It's kind of, you know, quite uh, fantasy word for me because my reality and is quite far from what they said. So, um, you know, hopeful kind of saying was not helpful, definitely not helpful to me. Instead of that kind of wording, um, lament language was very helpful to me. Just some friends um, lamented with me, uh, sometimes in silence, sometimes in crying. That was more helpful to deal with my suffering. Um, and uh, for me, um, in my situation, I was so young. I, I, I am pregnant. I was, when I was pregnant, I was only 24. And when I delivered my first baby, I was <laughs> 25. I don't know, I was young, but, but I, I felt like I was young. <laughs> so I was the first, I was the first person who pregnant and who delivered the baby among people around me. So there is no resources <laughs> to get some help. And my parents um, at that time worked and um, my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law uh, had no kind of interest, interest about my depression. <laughs> so I was so you know, isolated. Also, I was a, a part-time pastor in my faith community and my social location, uh, I think, prevented to open up my depression to the public. Because, you know, mm, I felt like I have to be faithful and I, <laughs> I have to be strong, something like that. So I don't want to um, show my vulnerability to my faith community. Did you find, this is an unscripted question, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, and I'll own that I'm asking it because I'm relating to a lot of what you just said about the young pregnancy and the baby and the being a pastor and the social location and the... <laughs> And the having your family as part of your faith community, but also trying to keep that sort of professionalization of your role as pastor while also being a mom. And that, um, that wanting to sort of, while your family is being a part of your church sort of integrates your professional and your personal lives but at the same time you want to keep that level of professionalism as a pastor and that um how, like how do you create a balance then about what is happening with your with your life and the like and that level of postpartum depression and how do you receive any support from your faith community 
Yeah. Um, that is annoying me. <laughs> yeah, definitely I failed to get some balance. <laughs> my depression verifies that kind, yeah, that kind of <laughs> my failure. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't get um, two rabbit because I want to be professional, but I couldn't. So I decided to, um, um, when I uh, delivered for, when I pregnant my first baby, I decided to quit the job. Yeah, I couldn't endure. And um, when I delivered my second baby, um, I kept my uh, career, but um, I don't know why, but uh, for me, working, uh, continuing working help, helped me to sustain depression. I, I don't know why, but I did. <laughs> how did your, um, how did your experience with, the, with, postpartum depression help your sense of discernment about vocation? Oh, oh that's a hard question. <laughs> Wendy. Maybe just something to consider, oh not god. necessarily something an to answer. Oh my god. <laughs> I've never thought before. <laughs> Because under the depression, I could not control my emotion and I could not control my daily life, even you know, carrying my two kids. So I think at that time, I could not, you know, managing or <laughs> acknowledging anything, what was wrong or what was good. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, sometimes sometimes questions are to tuck away and consider, <laughs> not answer. Thank you very much for sharing, Eliana. Yeah. yeah. Amy, I think the next question's yours. Yes, thank you so much. So this question's for you, Amira. And um this one's about something that you said in the abstract of your paper. Uh, that you wrote for us and we we're hoping you could unpack it a little bit for us so in the abstract of your paper you state quote in modern western culture it seems as if muslim women are subconsciously internalizing their own oppression and disciplining their actions and choices to comply with a norm that their male dominated community has defined unquote so we were hoping you could unpack this a little bit for us especially for our listeners who may come from a different faith tradition. Would you be able to explain a little bit about what this means? Sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I got into trouble for writing that. <laughs> <laughs> we get into trouble here. We like that. So <laughs> you're among friends. <laughs> uh, so well, most Muslim communities are still patriarchal community. We cannot deny that. Uh, yet living in a Western culture gave women a lot of agency and freedom that it, it's available for them. We cannot ignore that. But I see in most cases with the women that I encounter either in the community or client that um, the actual pressure come from the woman herself. Uh, she internalizes the belief that she's not good enough she's not strong enough or she's not smart enough or worthy enough or God will be upset if God forbid she did something different than what is intended or what is she has to do or the, the strict, uh, I wouldn't say religious, but more cultural norm that is defined for her. So it having to make these changes in her life and make her own choices become uh, a struggle. And in many cases, either she just resigned to uh, not doing any changes or she assumed a victimhood mentality again, like uh, what is uh, Martin Seligman called the um, learned helplessness. So mm -hmm. it, it, it just, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like, 
popping a pill or use some form of a spiritual bypassing and internalizing this belief that I cannot do it, I cannot change anything. Uh, and I cannot tell you how many times I heard women blaming themselves for their own depression. It's like saying, I should be more grateful. I should be, uh, I should have more faith and belief and uh, women accepting sometimes different form of abuse uh, and stating that it's what God decrees and I should be content and look at other women in the uh, war zone area or whatever. So I should be grateful for what I have. And yes, we should be grateful, of course, but this doesn't mean that I cannot change or do some form of um, transformation in my life. And if a woman start actually to make this change, I see, again, in most cases that there are other women who put her down. It's not the men, our other women from the community uh, is that putting her down or discouraging her? And it's it's like, um, you know, when the, this bucket of uh, crabs, when when we have a crabs in a bucket and, and one crab try to uh, climb the wall of a bucket to escape and all the crab, uh, mm. crabs right, start to pulling, pulling, pulling it down. Uh, and it, it's fun watching it in, in the crab world but when you see it in in, in actual women do, doing to each other it, it's sad so it's um so the pressure come from from the woman themselves from within herself and from the women community around her and for she most of the cases that i've seen thanks that's really helpful and i i guess i that's a follow-up question i want to ask you do you think the crabs are always going to be stuck in the bucket? Do you think that, or do you think that, um, you know, one crab will get out and then we'll grab onto another, another <laughs> crab? <and laughs> what, what do you think about the bucket? Uh, well, talking about sharing stories, I did escape the bucket. So it, it, and it wasn't easy and it wasn't pretty, but it's... Um, it's doable. I've seen so many women doing it. And it's not about being rebellious or uh, rejecting tradition or religion or even culture. It's about just uh, having your own voice and be assertive in, in, in your way and making your own choices. So it's some people are going to like it, some people want, and, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I wanted to just ask you about one term that you used just before about spiritual bypassing. Can you tell our listeners what that is in case they've never heard of it before? So spiritual bypassing is like using uh, the spirituality or, or religion to to, to by, by, bypass your hurt, your uh, your wound, and saying yeah, that uh, yeah, I'm uh, this is gonna uh, wipe away away my sins, or this gonna make uh, th this what God decrees. So and I'm grateful. And again, it's it's we all believe that, or in my my we believe that if you have to go through suffering, it's it's just God gave you reward for that, and and you should be grateful for anything. And we don't deny this part, but the spiritual bypassing is when I use this to stay into my uh, situation that it's uncomfortable situation, and I don't do anything to try to change it. And, and this is what is not meant by, by religion, basically, or it is not what is recommended by the religion. Yeah, that's so helpful. Thanks, Samira. I'm sure um, any, any of our listeners who, whose attention was piqued by that, you could do um, some more research on spiritual bypassing. So thank you so much. And I think Wendy's got our next one. So we were wondering if you, folks wanted just to take a few minutes to talk to each other and um, and what questions you have for each other, um, either based on reading each other's papers or the conversation we've been having so far. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, actually, I have five questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Too many, right? <laughs> Your paper was so intriguing, and you know, I'm not familiar with Muslim culture and uh, the religious Muslim. So yeah, it was very, you know, fascinating. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was wondering, is there any God's image to support woman's journey of transformation? Uh, sorry, what? God's, God's, God's image to support like woman's journey of transformation. Is there any? Uh, you mean image from from the from the religion? It's yeah, from the religion. Yeah. Um. Well, in, in many the stories or the, uh, the example, most of them are male. Uh, the, the protagonist of the story is usually male. There are a few images uh, of female, but in the, um, the histories, the uh, Islamic histories, there are lots of women uh, who have this, uh, we can call them role model that, achieves this transformation and achieves some some sort of uh, in their life and in the community. Mm. Unfortunately, we don't highlight this uh, as much. We don't use this as much as we use the, uh, the regular stories that we are used to or the prophets or the uh, and and maybe I uh, relate to what you said in, in the beginning of your paper that it's the, the role of the woman is more of uh, the she's a mother or she's a, a wife or mother and it's not a, a woman in uh, to do a role actually change in the society or a woman is a reformer uh, it's not highlighted as much in, in, in but certainly in history, we have a lot of examples. Mm. Thank you, Amira. It's very helpful. Mm. Yeah, I, and I also wonder about, um, are you pursuing kind of subversive, um, subversive action um, of men-dominated language and culture or co-creating um, the tradition of man dominated culture. What are you pursuing? Subversive or co creating? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't usually like to put things into boxes of specific uh, way of, of doing or seeing uh, things. Uh, so I, I don't really, uh, so maybe I didn't think uh, a lot about it in, in, in this way. Uh, and I believe it, it maybe it will come more uh, toward co-creating is like, it's, um, it's not about a fight between a man and a woman or, or male and female. It's more about we complement one another, we uh, help one another, and we, we, we just can uh, grow together or make this change together. If this answers your question, I'm not sure. Yeah, I was wondering, yeah, related to that, uh, where do you place um, the, tr the concept of a tr woman's transformation, like, you know, in relation to uh, the man-dominated culture? Uh, where I place the woman transformation, I mean, uh, are the men um, helping or supporting or... Is this your question? Um, yeah. Where do you place um, the 
transformation, the concept of women's transformation in, in the relation to men dominated culture? Um, I, don't, I, I don't see it as separate uh, because it's, um, as you said, there are lots of, of variation within the community itself. There are lots of men who are understanding, who are actually helping this transformation. And there are a lot of women who are on the opposite side. There are, they don't want anything to be transformed, anything to be challenged. So uh, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't fit into specific uh, pattern. It, it's just a lots of, it, it's, it depends on the person, on the context, on their own story. So it's very personal for, for every woman, her own transformation. And I've seen women who are satisfied with, with what the little change they get and they actually achieve happiness within maybe for, for me, I would a situation that I would not accept. And but they, they achieve their happiness, they achieve it, so they are happy, they, they are fine with it. And other women who want more, who want more change and more transformation on, on a bigger level. So it's uh, it depends on the woman uh, herself, on the community, on the support she, she's getting, on the, the mentality of the people around her. So it, there, there are lots of difference within a uh, lot of variation within every story. So quite subjective concept. Yeah. yeah. So do you, are you using like the concept of motor agency to Muslim women? Yes, it's very important. Yeah, uh, the motor agency is very important. And again, it's, uh, although there are some ontological beliefs, uh, there's still, subjective to every woman what she believes that is um, the morality and the beliefs and the um, the values that are most important to her with mm. her her belief and her understanding and her own agency within this her own belief mm. Yeah, and one more interesting thing, uh, when I read your paper, um, I could not recognize um, the concept of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> concept of lament or, you know, grief, something like that, how to deal with depression and, you know, social oppression, violence onto women, how to deal with this. Uh, this is, uh... From the model, it's a part that is the innermost cave or the belly of the whale. This is a yeah, yeah. woman. Uh, maybe I didn't use the same wording, uh, the, the language of lament, but this is basically what is meant to have this intimate conversation and intimate connection with God, talking to God mm. and having this, uh, like the like you said, the, the language of the songs that it's it's your you're talking to it's just it's uh, pouring your heart out to God and and um, showing your own your, all your vulnerability, all your pain, all your suffering, and and knowing that He's accepting that and He is the one who can achieve this changing within you. So this is a part with the where the we stayed a lot. For most women, we stayed a lot in, in this innermost cave. We stayed a lot with this intimate connection. And sometimes when we move to other stages, we still kept this as part of the practice or part of that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't change. Uh, and for me, I still have this, this, uh, this part of my self-care. It, it's always having this intimate conversation, intimate talk with God. Yeah, in 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 the case of lament, ha, lament has your relationship like with God and with public. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you mentioned about um, the cave and intimacy, is there any other connection to other people around us? 
Yeah, this is moving out when the the next step after the uh, the innermost cave is the transformation when she finds her own voice and having this uh, understanding of this uh, balance between having the own voice and agency and surrendering to the divine, surrendering this voice to the divine will, and then come the road back, where Joseph Campbell calls the road back. Uh, and this is when she has to integrate back into the community. And for some women, it could be the same community that she comes with. And for other women, they have to find their own community, their own support, where she can share her voice and be herself within this, this community. Be, uh, and uh, like share her story and not be ashamed or feel guilty or uh, having this uh, assertiveness again to, to, to be herself. So in uh, Joseph Campbell models is resurrection occur when only occur when you have to take this road back to community and integrate into the community because having your own voice and having your own agency doesn't mean anything if you stay into your home, into your cocoon and, and does, do, do not share, as you said, it's, uh, it has this dual part. You have to, it, it takes a lot of courage, it takes courage to reintegrate back and, and with all your wound, with all your vulnerability and, and go back to, to this, uh, either find your way back into society again. Yeah, from, from my understanding, your stages are not linear, but circular, right? Uh, it's, well, for, for simplification, I, I make it into a cycle, but it can be, uh, we can work on more, uh, more than one stage at the same time, or we can go back into the stages and, 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 uh, work our way back and then come forth. So it depends on everyone and everyone's need and everyone's story. How, how do we recognize we are transformed? When the woman feel that she found herself, found her voice, this is me, this is who I am. And uh, I am not afraid of sharing me and who I am and my identity uh, with, with others. So this is when the transformation. Doesn't mean that I solve all my problem and my life is like a fairy tale now, uh, but it means like it, it's like it's an inner, more of an inner transformation. It's finding myself, finding my voice, finding my true identity. <laughs> Thank you for answering me. It was too much. <laughs> I hope it makes sense of it. <laughs> Mira, do you have any questions for Eliana or any uh, comments on her paper? Yeah, sure. I um, first, I, I, as you said, Wendy, I, I relate a lot with, uh, with Eliana's paper also. It's um, especially when you said I didn't know what was happening to me. So this is exactly what I felt after when I had this postpartum depression is not a concept. Now we know it, it's called postpartum depression, but at the time when I had my children 24 years ago, it wasn't, um, it's, it, it just, and again, I fell into the same trap or of, uh, I'm not grateful. I should be grateful. I have everything. It's lack of faith. So I have to connect more, more with God. So I relate a lot to, your, to this part. And um, when also you talked about the sociocultural norm that a mother uh, should be happy, should be excited. Uh, and this was not uh, my feeling. <laughs> I, yeah, of course, I have this uh, this is having a baby is oh inspiring and it's a blessing and it, I'm, I'm very grateful but it comes with a lot of fear and it it, it doesn't come with this happy excited uh, thing so it's and, and also there is a hormonal mess in it so it's not uh, there's a pressure on the woman to 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 fit into the social cultural norm it, it makes sense yeah 
And I, I found the approach of the quick washing is very interesting. And, and I love how you portrayed how a simple right uh, can make a huge difference and how uh, you tied it to the biblical teaching of hospitality and the language of lament. And, uh, and I think the Middle Eastern culture, we have a ritual of food washing, but it's a women who do it for their husbands when they come back from work. And it's, uh, it, it, it is seen as uh, at the end of the day when you come back to work, so you're welcoming him with grounding and relaxing and honoring. Of course, in, in our time and day, we don't do this. I, mean, I think it's in the time of my grandmother, they used to do this was a, a normal thing for a woman to do to, to her husband. So it's, uh, it was interesting to see it. In, I, I never thought of it in the reverse. <laughs> uh, so maybe my, my question uh, would be, I wonder if you uh, took further or intend to take it further into practical application within the community, within the church, and how does the practical, practical application look like? whether in uh, with the church community or at home is the husband involved and and can can how can this be applied uh, practically and uh, maybe I, I, to second question after <laughs> to the second question yeah i um, i don't have any uh, dichotomy man and woman but <laughs> i think the sisterhood in that case um, is quite valuable because, you know, um, sometimes we had in certain difficult, difficulties, in certain cases, we, we want to find uh, people who went through the same difficulties or similar difficulties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, woman elders or, you know, um, mothers or um, girls, all generation of a woman uh, gather together and comport her uh, who are in depression, postnatal depression, or um, like um, experience some kind of um, missing babies, um, including stillbirths, something like that. So um, to deal with that kind of conversation for me, um, if there is a man, you know, <laughs> I cannot fully express my feeling and fully express what um, happened to my body. It is uncomfortable. So, <laughs> yeah, postnatal related to, you know, woman's physical body, mm -hmm. I think sisterhood is uh, quite valuable. Yeah, mm -hmm. to practice some kind of lament or something ritual. Yeah, yeah, I totally relate. Yeah, <laughs> and and I wonder if you encountered any resistance or rejection for the idea from the community. Uh, for for now, uh, from from now, no, no. I mean, so far there is no rejections, and okay. uh, so um, I am a uh, I am an, a writer and editor for uh, what is this like. Uh, worship order of my denomination. Um, I put this uh, liturgy, put foot washing related to depression and um, um, missing. Uh, how, how, what, what was that? What was the correct word? Uh, miscarriage, miscarriage and stillbirth. Um, I used uh, lament language and mm -hmm. foot washing. Um, to deal with that kind of um, suffering. And um, other people love my idea. <laughs> yeah, <I can. laughs> yeah, but I expect some kind of rejection. If someone doesn't like um, to talk about her own suffering, mm -hmm. about very personal thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Crabs in the bucket, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you both so much for sharing. And we just have one question left 
uh, that we ask everyone who comes on the podcast and we just want to know how do you take care of your soul as you're doing this work, uh, especially for both of you who are digging into some difficult topics um, like depression. So Amira, how, what does your self-care look like? Uh, you mentioned that you go to the cave and you talk to God as a part of your self-care. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Uh, well, this is one, one very important for me. Another thing is my art journaling. Uh, it's, a, it's a big thing. It's um, when time and sometimes when time gets harder, I put to, for myself to do a hundred day challenge where I do a page of our journal every day. And recently I started Daily Joys. So I'm starting to pay, to pay, pay one page a day about uh, a daily joy that I find. And, um, and this is, it's, I've been researching joy for some time now. And, and I've been noticing that I, what I call happy or joyful feeling is mainly feeling of content or gratitude. So this is this fine line. So I wanted to, learn or teach myself how to add more joy in my life so this is i'm doing through art journaling and uh, one of the the, the thing i uh, i found in, in in this journey that it, it was an 11th century muslim scholar who described joy as, as sitting on three pillars one of them is the first one was anger which was very interesting for me that one of the first pillar of joy he defined as anger and and I felt this is the missing part so I'm using my art journal to explore this now and mm-hmm. um, I noticed that my art pages become more messy and chaotic and random um, as they come more messy chaotic and random my mind and my heart are starting to become more at peace so it, it's like if I'm, I'm putting this uncertainty and fear and anger out there instead of mm-hmm them or putting them on the back burner in my in my mind um uh, guess another soul care for me is experimenting in the kitchen i have uh, a little herbal apothecary and uh, i love to play with herbs and spices and teas and recipes and my kids call it uh, mom is uh, preparing her witch brew again so. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Amira. And, and what about you, Eliana? What's your soul care like? Um, my soul care is just letting me um, have kind of freedom to complain to God <laughs> about my situation and anger at God. <laughs> Sometimes crying uh, makes me breathe. So I uh, usually let me immersed enough in my feeling, let me down enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I usually do not find some kind of piece of, some piece of joy, but <laughs> um, caring others helps me a lot. Sitting with them and listening, listening to their stories, especially you know, suffering experience, and hug with them, something like that. (laughs) Oh, that sounds beautiful. Hugs are so good. Well, we just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories with us today. I feel like it's been a real powerful time of sharing. So thank you. And uh, are there any any last thoughts you want to share with our listeners before we go? Interesting. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Agree. Yes, you're so welcome. And Wendy, thank you so much for being brave and coming on and co-hosting the podcast for the first time. It was a it was a real joy. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.